<laughs> and now we proceed to the actual part of the Mahamudra uh, instructions proper and uh, to this point, uh, uh, in regard of, uh, to this point it says in the text, now in order to find out Mahamudra itself, the following applies. That which we call Mahamudra is the profound view of the secret Mantrayana as it calls it, is called or the Vajrayana. And it says in our text here, from the Buddha Vajradhara, this has been transmitted through the great master, the great Brahmin Saraha, down to myself. <coughs> down to myself in this case means this has been the instructions from the Buddha Vajradhara via Saraha and all the lineage masters and so forth have been received by the one who <coughs> of these instructions, which was no one else but the first Sunday Emperor of the Tashitajo, and also down to the one who wrote all of these down and composed these texts on the basis of these instructions, which was the eighth Kamapa Mikajoy. It says not only have these instructions uh, been handed down from that time until uh, these two masters received them, but also the blessing and inspiration that goes with that lineage. <coughs> and if one were to put these into practice, these instructions, uh, and uh, which are endowed with such blessing and inspiration, then one should proceed as follows. <coughs> So the actual explanation of the practice comes along in four steps, each of which is subdivided into three, so there are 12 points. Uh, all of these, well, the first three of them are rather similar in words. There are the three things to be relaxed, the three points to be released, the three to be abandoned, and finally the three to be destroyed. Now, coming to the first three, the three things, the three points that have to be relaxed are nothing else but our bodies, our speech, and our minds of consciousness. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, 
So now to the first of these three points, which are to be, uh, which are to be the next. The first of these three is, of course, our bodies. We start or we go about this little exception of the bodies by way of uh, recognizing the fact that that ordinary body of ours is completely empty of any inherent existence. As it says in the text, we purify this ordinary body of ours to, by way of purifying it through bliss and emptiness. Having in such a way come to understand, to see that this body of ours is empty, truly non-existent, we then arise in the state in the form of the Yidam Devi. We imagine ourselves to our bodies to appear in the form of a Yidam Devi. We imagine us uh, appearing out of this empty state. And then we proceed to remind ourselves of the, the fact or to recognize the fact that also this shape of the Yidam Devi, that body which we have just created in our imagination, that essentially it is just as empty as our modern bodies. Nevertheless, it appears clear. However, the main characteristics of such a body, which is based on the empty yet appearing, is that it is just so. It is free from any substance, it is free from any inherent existence, and it, uh, it is empty yet appearing. This is the way of commencing our bodies. Now, having initially relaxed our bodies, we now proceed to the relaxation of our speech. And it is, it is said in that respect, relaxing our speech is nothing else but the continuous repetition of mantra. If we were to continuously repeat mantra, then this is nothing else but the movement of our inner breath, or wind as it is called, uh, within our body. We constantly repeat mantra in such a way, and uh, this corresponds to the movement of this wind within the central channel of ours, which is called the Aradhuta. As we proceed in such a way, we imagine that while the inner breath is an exile of breath, so this is being blessed by the three seed syllables, which are Om, A, and Hum. So as we inhale our breath, we uh, do this as corresponding to the seed syllable Om. As the breath rests within our body, we imagine this to be uh, corresponding to the seed syllable A. And as we exhale our breath, we imagine this to correspond to the seed syllable Hum. Now, doing this one pointedly, com fully concentratedly, this uh, brings about a state of uh, non-thought within us, brings about a state which is completely free from any mental activity, from any uh, thought disturbances of whatever kind, and re 
resting in this experience, this continuous experience <coughs> of, uh, of uh, this one consciousness, this in itself is again completely empty, free of any self nature, free of any substance whatsoever. It expresses as great bliss, and it is said that this continuous <coughs> resting in this uh, experience of emptiness and great bliss it soon becomes unbearable. Continuously resting within this is the realization of our speech. We now proceed to the third point that has to do with rest. Which is that we speak this up a little bit, unfortunately, we have to finish the text today. This is our last teaching on it this morning. Having relaxed our bodies in the prescribed manner, and having also relaxed our speech in the prescribed manner, one might wonder wherein we relax these. What is it that we relax and who is uh, the one that relaxes? Well, all of these three points are essentially empty, essentially non existent. There is no inherent existence to any of these whatsoever. And this pertains to the three points, the third point of these three, uh, namely that of our consciousness, of, of our minds. We rest within this, in this recognition of all of these five, three points being <coughs> free of any inherent existence. And therefore, this pertains to the third point of the relaxation. Therefore, these three points, relaxation of body, speech, and that of our minds of consciousness have been explained. I left some Tell So we proceed to the second set of three. First, there were these three points to be relaxed. Now we proceed to the three points to be released. This deals predominantly with the fact that uh, we constantly attach all kinds of thoughts, ideas, concepts, and so forth to that which we don't perceive. It deals with anything that is being perceived through, as it says in the text, our five doors, which means the five senses, the senses of seeing, of hearing, of uh, perceiving sense, smells, and so forth. And uh, these kinds, of, these, these, these five types of consciousnesses, they themselves are not yet uh, obscured in any which way by any thoughts or concepts. It is us who uh, attach these uh, to that which we perceive and hold for real and so forth. 
This is being practiced by way of um, <coughs> putting oneself into a particular physical position, the so-called uh, position of the seven points of Vairochana, and combining this uh, physical position with various gazes through which we perceive <coughs> the outer objects uh, and, and uh, look at them in various ways, so as to make the experience or come to the understanding that somehow they are no matter how we look at them, that they are in a certain way ungraspable. Somehow they seem, they, they start to appear as a, in a certain way <coughs> unreal to us. However, that which perceives that, that consciousness of ours, that in itself remains completely clear and unsolid, and it always comes to having made these perceptions and having recognized the true mode of being of these, it always comes to rest in its own place again. <coughs> This is the first steps of the three points which are to be released. The second point should be released deals predominantly with our mental activity, that constant thought activity of ours, which constantly labels everything that which it perceives and uh, attaches mistakenly a self nature to each and everything that it perceives. This is being released, as it is called in the text, by way of uh, taking, uh, or taking up the physical position and uh, giving rise to, to devotion and confidence in such a way this kind of consciousness, this mental activity that takes place within it, which labels everything, uh, is being bound and it comes to exhaust itself eventually. This kind of releasing is called the releasing upon uh, uh, the releasing based upon uh, the uh, consciousness which perceives. So it comes to it comes to what what comes to pass is sort of an exhaustion of that mental activity, which uh, gradually comes to see the non-existence of that which it has been so busily labeling uh, ever since. And all of these experiences, these ideas. These concepts which are being attached to each and everything that's being perceived, they start to fade. <laughs> This is the experience which comes about is one which is free from the various uh, disturbances or agitations or whatever mental activity has uh, been uh, taking place. You simply rest in the awareness of this and let it be at that. I'm sure about some. 
Now, having experienced this, having uh, experienced that this consciousness of ours is in no way whatsoever graspable, definable, we cannot characterize it in any which way whatsoever, uh, we proceed to the second point, the second point to be abandoned of these three, which is the experience of insight in that consciousness of ours being completely ruthless, being completely causeless. Nevertheless, it is the root or the cause for the never ceasing, never ending uh, mental activity or thought activity which takes place in it. The only thing that uh, can be done is that we can, uh, for a short moment, glimpse it in the moment of cessation of mental activity. Only within this can it be uh, momentarily glimpsed. But no matter how we try, no matter how hard we uh, 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 try to put a finger on it or to characterize it in any which way, uh, this can <coughs> not be done. Simply resting within this recognition which comes about through this cessation is the second of three to be abandoned. And now to the third point of uh, the three points to be abandoned, which is the abandoning upon the basis of their 
being nothing that can in any which way be examined. If we were to examine or analyze this consciousness of ours, this mind of ours, uh, we would not be able to pinpoint it in any which way. It is completely, it will always remain elusive, it will always remain completely untraceable. We could not even resolve or decide whether or not it has any particular mode of being, whether or not uh, there is a cessation, whether or not uh, there is anywhere where it rests and so forth. It is completely beyond any such analysis or, or examination for that matter. If we were to analyze it, examine it as to whether or not it has any particular shape, we could never resolve that to be the case or not. If we were to analyze it uh, in regard to uh, this consciousness having uh, uh, a particular color or being sound or anything of that matter, we could never come <coughs> to any, to, to any uh, conclusion in such examination because this consciousness of ours remains so completely untraceable, so completely elusive. Therefore, no matter how we try, no matter how hard we try, how hard we try to pinpoint any characteristics upon this consciousness of ours, uh, it will never be sufficient because it will, all, it will forever remain uh, elusive to us. So this is the third point to be abandoned, that uh, examination uh, which strives to pinpoint this consciousness in any which way. <laughs> You know, we proceed to the from the, the three points to be uh, to be abandoned to the three things and points to be destroyed. The final of these four. Pardon,今天,我们都跟着他,马西吧,这么多经济,我们都跟着他,马西吧,这么多经济,我们都跟着他,马西吧,这么多经济,我们都跟着他,马西吧,这么多经济,我们都跟着他,马西吧,这么多
Now to the second point of that which is which will in the end be completely destroyed or collapse. <laughs> this is about the idea that this consciousness of ours which we so constantly strive to examine and to pinpoint and to characterize that this consciousness has the risk thinking or holding this consciousness to be something that has arisen already with that within this idea of the rising of such a consciousness, there is a non arising. Already the idea of such a consciousness, the consciousness having arisen in itself, shows that it is a non arising, a non arisen entity, and already the idea itself is free of having any arising, as is non arising. If, however, we were to hold on to the idea that even the thought of labeling something as arisen or non arisen, has in any which way arisen, we will come by way of contemplating this or by way of examining it to see that even within this there is non-arising. Therefore, holding on to these ideas and concepts of consciousness being arisen means that uh, there, as we examine it and analyze it, there would naturally it follows out of this, there would have to be no further arising. Now that being the case, but something uh, seemingly appearing as further arising, this would uh, by necessity mean that the previous arising had not, had not been necessary. So as we examine this entire complex and come to the conclusion that uh, within that which we label as arising, there actually is nothing but non-arising, and even the action arising within our consciousness of this, the action of uh, examining something that has seemingly arisen, even that in itself proves to be non-arising. And in such a way, examining accordingly, this entire idea, this entire uh, train of thought completely collapses. <laughs> ในนี้ก็เป็นนอมบัลที่งอสังบานในกราฟิกอยู่แต่ไม่รู้ถ้าเส้นดาราเห็นกราฟิกเกอร์สุดท้ายที่ตั้งนะงอสังนั้นนะ
or whether it is just about to cease, then again, if we would examine a ceased consciousness, we could not do so because it has ceased. Cessation has taken place, there is nothing to be examined anymore. On the other hand, if we were to examine in regard to whether it is just about to cease, well then cessation is still taking place, therefore there is nothing that has ceased, so again there is no cessation to be examined. This entire idea of something ceasing or being about to cease in itself needs to exist, because we cannot properly apply it to any of these two points. We only have these two, these two abilities or these, these two um, possibilities, and in both cases, in both instances, the entire idea or concept does not properly apply. Again, if we were to examine something as to whether or not it undergoes cessation that has ceased already, there is no object to be examined anymore. So the whole idea of cessation uh, becomes mute. Similarly, if we were to examine something that is presently in the process of ceasing, well then cessation has not yet taken place. Therefore, again, there is no grounds of examination in any which way whatsoever. And this is then the third of these three points uh, to, by, by way of which uh, this entire complex of ideas of the abiding, non-abiding, arising, non-arising, cessation or non-cessation completely collapses. So having proceeded through these sort of points, through these uh, various uh, examinations and analysis, we have come to see, or we will come to see, if we were to examine in such a way, that that which we hold to be true, or that which we strive to examine, is completely free of any characteristics whatsoever. It is not only free of any characteristics, it is even beyond any way of being characterized in any which way whatsoever. It is completely free from anything that we could possibly pinpoint onto it. If we were to examine it again, if we were to examine it as to whether it has any belief or not, we could not conclusively resolve that to be the case or not. If we were to examine um, whether it has any characteristics of any particular kind or not, again, we could not come to any, uh, to any conclusive uh, um, conclusion. Therefore, examining in such a way our, our knowledge or understanding of uh, that which uh, we, we examine, that consciousness of ours uh, is uh, being sharpened in such a way as to understand that we are dealing with something that is completely uh, beyond being defined in any which way whatsoever. And this corresponds to the view as it is being set forth, as it is being um, um, propagated by the proponents of the view of the Madhyamika, the intermediate or the great middle way. <coughs> So the neighbor come home to our church, the middle of the school is on the list. So they come to the last of the temple, the other half of the day. And I'm all about so the number that she found to come home to our church, the middle of the school is a man of that. And the author of our text, the gates to mark the middle of the closes, finishes by way of praying or asking the aspiration that may all beings by way of such examination or analysis, recognize their true basic nature free of any mistakes. May they recognize this, uh, their, their inborn nature unmistakably and attain the state of Sanghiyata. <coughs> Your name is and your name is a 
Now this Mahamudra instruction that we have now received from the last couple of days is already a rather concise one. If we were to summarize this further, Prabhupada says, in which way could we practice? If one were to practice these instructions, one would sit down on the seat and one would first start out as with any other practice by way of going for, your, going for refuge. Having taken refuge, we then proceed to bring about an enlightened attitude. And having done that, we might proceed to practice the Guru, to imagine the form of the Gurus, to uh, receive the empowerment, to then finally merge our mind streams with that of our Guru by way of imagining the Guru, the Dharma, to dissolve into light and melt into ourselves. We then rest completely free of any reference point within this basic consciousness. And as we rest within this consciousness, we familiarize ourselves with this consciousness. However, as we are beginners, it is very likely that after a rough, short time, again, a thought will arise, and the activity will start again. Instead of now attaching all sorts of ideas and concepts to such a thought, or trying to suppress that thought, we simply watch it as what it is. We simply watch that thought, or view that thought as being nothing else but the self-expression of our consciousness, the play, the natural plays of that consciousness. And then gradually, of course, that thought will subside again. If we do not do anything about it, there's no point at all in manipulating this thought activity as appears within our consciousness as our minds in any way whatsoever. <laughs> Proceeding in such a way is called the way of practicing uh, Vipassana as a beginner. And uh, accordingly, we should practice and put these points as we have received instructions upon them into practice in such a way. <laughs> And occasionally, you should also practice uh, the peaceful rest, which is known as Shamatha or Shin in meditation. And whether we practice it one way or the other, at the end of our meditation session, there always has to be the dedication of merit. Through such practice, we accumulate merit, positive merit that we then dedicate for the sake and welfare of all beings. And proceeding in such a way, practicing in such a way, that is what we call practicing Mahamudu. <laughs> So she will now proceed to give us the long, the oral transmission uh, of a collection of mantras of divides as they were put together by Harold. And there's one point which she likes to stress. There is a short uh, Milarepaguri or other that has been produced uh, that is apparently missing a few points, some small points. I'd like to just point out that I was the one who supplied that text, so the omission of this is in small prints as, as well. And she says it is absolutely not okay to produce a text in such a way, because that will only lead to confusion and we will not know uh, who has composed the text and what the 